binding energy. We're going to start out this video with a question. What subatomic particles are present in the nuclei? And this is for any nuclei. Do you say protons and neutrons? If so, you're correct. Now, we know this already, so why am I asking you this? I want you to think about something. What are their charges? We know that protons are positive and neutrons are neutral. And so now the real question is, are these naturally attracted to each other? We know things of positive charges are going to actually be repelled from each other. So what holds these nuclei together? That's what this podcast is going to be about. In this video, we'll talk about how nuclei manage to stay together even though they are filled with positive charges. We'll learn to calculate what we call the mass defect, and from that, the nuclear binding energy of a nucleus, as well as the nuclear binding energy per nucleon, and comment on its relative stability of the nucleus based on this number. Nuclei are held together with what we call nuclear binding energy. In this process, mass is converted into energy. If you add up the component parts of a nuclei, there are protons or neutrons, or all of the components of an atom, in other words, neutrons, protons, and electrons, what you'll find is that the masses don't add up. The mass of the nuclei is always less than what you would expect. This difference is called the mass defect. Let's do a question. We will calculate the mass defect. I tell you the mass of 19 fluorine. In this case, I'm telling you the mass of the entire atom, so that includes electrons as well. I give you the mass of a hydrogen atom, or in other words, one proton and one electron, and the mass of a neutron, and I ask you to find the mass defect. First, we need to calculate what we would expect the mass to be given the number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. We know the masses of a proton and an electron, and we know the mass of a neutron. So we can simply do the multiplication and addition to get our number. From here, if we want to know our mass defect, we know our difference in mass because we know the mass that was given, we know the mass that we would expect, and we subtract. And we get a difference in mass of 0.1587 AMU. Now let's talk about how we actually convert this into energy to calculate the binding energy. Here, we finally get around to telling you uh, what E equals mc squared means. This gives us the binding energy from the mass defect. Our delta M is our mass defect. Our delta E is our binding energy. There's going to be some useful conversions that you need to use for this section. For Herstoff, one kilograms is equal to this many AMU. And then it's useful to always remember that one joule is one kilogram meter squared per second squared. And I want to especially point out this kilograms so that we're aware that we always need to convert our mass into kilograms. So this must always be in kilograms. We'll use this mass defect to calculate the binding energy. We'll also divide by the number of nucleons, or in other words, things that live in the nucleus, so protons and neutrons, in order to get the binding energy per nucleon, which is actually a more useful measurement for us. Let's continue on with our example. We have our binding energy of F, or excuse me, we have our mass defect of F. We've calculated this on previous slides. From here, we need to convert this into kilograms before we can fill in to E equals mc squared. We do this using the conversion that I talked about on the previous slide. This is a good conversion to always know. We fill this into E equals mc squared. Now, typically your mass defect ends up being negative depending on how you take the subtraction. This, the sign is not super important here. You just need to always know that the nuclei itself is smaller than the component parts. So just make sure when you do binding energy, that you always have this be positive. So here we have our E. We fill in, we fill in our M into M. We know that C is the speed of light. 
and we fill in to get our answer. This is our total binding energy, which is a nice value to calculate. However, when we actually want to talk about nuclear stability, we want to account for how many nucleons that energy is actually holding together. And so we'll often want to know binding energy per nucleon, in which case you just divide by the number of protons and neutrons that are in the nucleus to get our final answer. Let's do another example straight through. Given the mass of a hydrogen atom and a neutron, find the mass defect binding energy and binding energy per nucleon in lithium-7. And I give you the mass of lithium-7 here. We need to calculate our expected value for the mass of lithium. We know that there are four neutrons and three protons and electrons. And so we can fill in the fact that we have four neutrons, fill the mass in, three protons and electrons, and we fill that mass in to get the mass of all the component parts. We then subtract that from the actual mass to get our mass defect. Again, don't worry too much about whether this is negative or positive. It just depends on how you do the subtraction. And in reality, isn't a big deal because we know that the actual nuclei is always lighter than the component parts. Now that we have our mass defect, we can fill in to equals mc squared. First, we need to convert into kilograms though. And so we use our AMU to kilogram conversion to get our mass in kilograms. Now it simply fills into E equals MC squared to get our joules. This is our total binding energy though. And we often wanna look at binding energy per nucleon. And so we need to see how many nucleons we have. We have four neutrons, three protons, so in other words, we have seven nucleons. So we divide this by seven in order to get joules per nucleon. You can report joules per nucleon simply in joules. I like to add in the nucleon just to separate it out and say, hey, look, we're doing this per nucleon, not per nucleus. But you're welcome to just leave it as joules if you want as well. Now, I've been hinting that this binding energy per nucleon has to do with stability. And now we can look and see what actually happens. The higher the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable the nucleus. Notice we say per nucleon. This is because if you simply look at the binding energy itself, it will always go, it will always go up as you increase the size of the nucleus. And that's just because there's more things to hold together. However, once you divide by the nucleon, you normalize for that. Things will want to get to the more stable situation. So here, if you look at the very top of our graph, our most stable nuclei is iron 56. So things that are smaller than iron 56 will generally undergo fusion. In other words, come together to get larger, to get closer to iron 56. And things that are generally to the right of iron 56 will try to get smaller or will undergo fission in order to get closer to that most stable nuclei. In my view, binding energy is calculated by the finding the difference in the mass between the actual and expected values for the nuclei. The higher the binding energy per nucleon, the more stable that the nucleus is.